medical doctor. And uh, when I was young, uh, well, when I was really, really young, I wanted to be a medicine woman. Um, but growing up in a scientific family uh, and around hospitals, what you did was you went to medical school and you became a doctor. You know, that's what we do. Um, and I was pretty, um, I was really strong, really um, strong-willed. Um, I knew what needed to get done and I would get it done. And I was pretty much all set to finish my residency, which is a three-year internal medicine residency, and then do a fellowship. And in the end of my second year of my residency, I had a, an experience that changed the course of my life. And what happened was that I was uh, doing a procedure. Now, this is called the central line. So, and, and what we do is we put a big needle in the vein in the neck and we, you know, put it through so that we can get access to a person who's very sick in the intensive care unit. And I had managed to do the procedure. It was probably three o'clock in the morning when the nurse had called me to do that procedure. And, you know, I'd done hundreds of them, so I was pretty capable. And uh, I, everything went fine. And then the patient who was on a, a ventilator, uh, not breathing for himself, started coughing. And so, of course, the needle slipped and went right into my finger. Now, this is 1996. And in 1996, uh, when we were at a city hospital, the major a good number, good 50, at least 50% of the patients had HIV from IV drug use, which meant they also probably had hepatitis C and all these other things, which we didn't even think about back then. This is 96. So in any case, my patient had full-blown AIDS, and I had blood, his blood, in my blood at this point. And, um, you know, when I talk about it, I want people to understand that, that fear was not my first experience. You know, when I stuck myself, my first experience was actually shame. You know, I thought, oh my God, what have I done? I've screwed up. How can I fix it? Because I'm this strong-headed person that fixes things. Mm -hmm. And when I'm squeezing my finger and it's turning blue, and I'm, I'm, I'm realizing I can't fix this. You know, I can't, I don't know what to do. It was the helplessness that sent me into stress. And I called my best friend who was a chief resident, and I said, Eric, this is what's going on. And he said, nothing at first. Right. You don't want to get the silence. And he said, geez, you know, not sure what to do. We're going to need to get you tested for HIV to get a baseline. I'm going to send you home. It's like four o'clock in the morning at this point. And I'll call the attending to see what to do. I'll we'll probably get you started on one drug called AZT. And uh, uh, he called, you know, he told me to call somebody to take me home. I was in no condition. And uh, as soon as I got home, my phone rang. Now, this is when, before we had cell phones, just so that you can imagine, like, this phone is ringing at 4 o'clock in the morning. And that was the infectious disease attendant who was on call, who said, I heard about the needle stick. There was a study that just came out from the NIH, the National Institute of Health, uh, looking at post-exposure prophylactic cocktail of medications you take when you've been exposed to HIV. And it's about 14 pills a day for six weeks. And we're putting you on it. You're going to be one of like the study. So, um, you know, he started spewing statistics. And what I tell people when I remember in that time was I don't remember the statistics. You know, I don't, I maybe like, all I remember is that you're going to be the one in a thousand, right? Like one in a thousand converts, I'm going to be the one, right? When it's that negative. And I thought, went into all this despair. You know, how am I going to pay off my student loans? Who's going to hire me? You know, what have I done? You know, my parents, they're going to, they co sign They're going to have to pay all this money now. Um, I went right into guilt. But the thing that actually made me cry the most was the absolute despair around dying alone. That I was single and I was never going to find love because who's going to love me now? And that's what sent me into absolute and utter despair. And I cried all the time for six weeks. The only time I didn't cry was when I was with people. So my friends and family just rallied and stayed around me constantly. I got very sick from the medication. And I continued to work, of course. I just would walk around with, you know, doubled over. Um, and made it through. But during that six weeks, I did some bargaining, right? I'm thinking, all right, if there is a God, and you let me live. I swear I will be a better person. Again, wow. you think about it, in retrospect, was I a bad person? 
what made me even say that, right? And I, I'm, I'm saying this for listeners to understand that there is this internal dialogue that we have that we're not even aware of that's part of our programming, right? And like, what made me think I was a bad person? That I'm going to be better, right? I'm going to, you know, give my life to the others. I'm going to be in service. I'm going to be selfless, more selfless, you know? And so when six weeks later, my test came out negative, I thought, okay, I've got to live up to my part of the bargain. And I also was rethinking, like, I don't think I want to do a fellowship right now in the intensive care unit. I don't want to do this. Like, do I really want to work with people that are, you know, walking over into the other side? Or do I want to work with people who are actually living? Like, what am I doing? So I decided to not do my fellowship. And I followed a, a you know, I was going to take this really seriously. You know, I'm going to be a better person. And I went and worked with a midwife who looked, worked with underserved population. You know, I'm being really good here, right? I'm being a better person and helping the needy. Um, I rolled my eyes at that. And I worked with the midwife to learn how to work with women and all this sort of thing. And I was really like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but, you know, I'm going to figure it out. And I'm, you know, getting, I'm rallying. I'm starting to get my energy back. And then my dog died. Oh, wow. And then my grandfather died. And then I said, oh, I, then I met somebody. And, uh, and, and his ex-girlfriend started harassing me, writing letters to the medical board. So the medical board had to investigate whether or not to investigate. I said, I don't even know this woman. <laughs> wow. Just felt everything at the same time. Everything was just tumbling. And I said, I need to get away. And I decided I was going to go to the Sinai Desert, which is my favorite place to just lose myself and, you know, go into oneness with the Bedouins. And I came back and I was at peace. And I said, I'm ready to be a minimalist. And my very dear friend said to me, watch your words. And the very next day, my apartment burned down. When I heard that, I was just so frozen in the chair. <laughs> and then my father has a heart attack. He's alive. Thank you. Thank goodness. But, you know, it was June to November. That's the period of all of this happening. Wow. So five months. It brought me to my knees because every time I got knocked down, I would, you know, kind of, you know, I would fall and then rally back up fall back down, rally back up, fall back down, rally back up. And at this point, I was like, I don't have it left to me to rally back up. I'm done. And I became profoundly, profoundly depressed. I just didn't want to live anymore. I didn't have the energy to smile. I didn't have the energy to do anything. And I, you know, I, I couldn't take my own life. That wasn't like how bad it was, but I also didn't want to live. You sort of in this sort of this place of like, I don't have the energy anymore to live. This is it's too much. Right. Like everything I do, I just keep getting knocked down. Like, why me? Why me? Why me? And that went on for like three months. And then a, a friend took me out to dinner. And um, again, in retrospect, I can see that it was maybe an intervention. And she said, uh, we want you back. We miss you. You haven't been the same in almost a year since the needle stick. And we want you back. And again, I don't know. I don't know what clicked. There was something just clicked and I woke up and said, hmm. you know, I've been taking all of this very personally. I keep saying, why me? But the real question is, why not me? Nature just as soon lets a forest fire burn as a flower bloom. And it's not personal. And somehow I keep thinking I'm being punished as if I'm bad. And where did that come from? Because I clearly am not that bad. My friends and colleagues have rallied around me and loved me despite everything that's going on. That's one thing that's kept me together. So it was that point that I knew that I needed to follow my earlier dreams as a child to learn about medicine woman and uh, learn about mind-body medicine and also to learn about stress and love, which is why I decided to volunteer at the um, Benson Henry Institute, the Mind-Body Medical Institute at Harvard, where I was working and started learning about that stuff. And things just kind of transpired until I left my job as a primary care doctor and that's all I did. So, and that's what I've been developing over the past 20 years is merging East and West and helping people understand what the inner twinings are, the inner makeup that is leading them to lead their lives to for their bodies to be the way they are and figuring out how big their fittest and best selves, mind, body, and spirit. And that was, 
that's really what catapulted that process. And how lucky are we? How I mean, so <laughs> so lucky. I, I I didn't mean to ask you this, but but I have to. Do you think that sometimes we need something that drastic to wake up? Because I uh, yes, because like, I've had several of them. <laughs> oh, okay, so you had you had right? Because I feel like I'm, well, you know, I'm, I always. I always say that the body whispers before it screams. Oh, I right? think we're going to be, that's a quotable, yeah. Right? That's the body whispers before it screams. And that's sort of what happens. You get these signs that you're not on the right path. You get these signs. Like I work with so many people who are miserable at their jobs, right? Or, and friends who are like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And they're complaining about their jobs. And then I say, well, if you don't do something about it, you're going to get kicked in the butt. I don't say it that nicely sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you're, if spirit is telling you that this isn't right for me, if you don't make the right yourself, the universe will do it for you, right? <laughs> and so that's what happens. And then all of a sudden, you know, like everyone's getting laid off or the company goes bankrupt or something like that. I said, you see, you kind of had the warning signals. And so we, we pretty much get warning signals often. You know, it, there's very little that happens out of left field. And even for the body, it takes a long time for the body to get sick. There's other things that are going on usually that are giving you the signals that something's happening. There's signals that are telling you that the conversation is going the wrong way. And little nuances that when we start becoming aware of the subtle nuances that our body's giving us, that there's little signals intuitively that we can capture, then we can actually create change you know, when people talk about manifestation, it's really about being able to be in that wavelength of being able to be in coherence with what's happening around you and make the right choices. Wow. Right? You have a smooth path as a loss to a bumpy one. So yeah, I get that often if I'm not, you know, doing, you know, listening. You know, I get I get slapped around, you know. <laughs> this, is, this is all of us. And sometimes I feel like I the stubborn ones need to need more more warning. I'm trying to learn learn and feed into that. And I think this is a perfect segue actually into you know your book, your hell destiny. So this is relatively new for me, about a year and a half that I've been going down the, the rabbit hole. Like my emotions and my thoughts are creating this ease or ease in the body so right. please enlighten us because that is such a different it was a difficult thing to wrap my head around it yeah. right and mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear your thoughts and and, and um, right well just so i think the most important thing to understand is the concept of stress which people say all the time but the really stress is just an element of uh, physiology of physics and it's basically when a system is no longer in balance it's, it's called stress. That's really all it is, that there's a stress to the system that's in balance. And every living organism, including human beings, have a desire to be in a state of balance, which is homeostasis in the biological world. And the problem is, is and, and you know, what's interesting is, is that when you read um, the uh, tra traditional Chinese medicine, the literature from thousands and thousands of years, they talk about it right about the yin and the yang right. and about you know the shin and the and the the jing and the shen and all the you know the the parts of the body and the, and the and sort of the elements the universe and the cosmos is that everything seeks to be in the state of balance of the yin and the yang right however it's impossible to maintain nothing nothing can be in stillness without opposition okay that's those are the words Okay, it's pretty heavy. It is. But, so what I do is I take this heavy kind of esoteric stuff, whether it's scientific or spiritual, and then tease it into something that actually makes sense to people, right? So what does that mean? Nothing can exist in stillness with some type of opposition. That means you're not going to be sitting here in a comfortable position for very long before you get uncomfortable. That's true. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just the nature of a moving, living, breathing environment. Like the weather changes. You go from night to day. So even though the day might be beautiful, it's not going to last. It's going to eventually come in tonight. So the body will be in a place where you've eaten, you're satiated, you've got all the fuel you need, and then you run out of fuel, right? That's the opposition. So the stress is that you're no longer satiated, that the body needs fuel. That's the stress. Okay, so it's, it's constant, and without it, we'd be dead. So if you don't have stress, you're dead. 
Okay. But there's, so stress is in itself. It's not a bad thing. It's just, so what happens is, is that when the body's in, in stress, it needs to have a way of letting the higher mind know. Okay. So you've got like a lower brain and a higher brain. Just keep it simple. The lower brain picks up the, the imbalances and it turns on a physiological response called the stress response, which creates symptoms, feelings, sensations. And those sensations alert us to do something. Okay, so the hunger is telling you what? Go eat. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that as an infant, you didn't know the feeling that you had was called hunger, and you didn't know what to do about it because you didn't have a brain yet. <laughs> you didn't have much of a brain. Very good and side. So the development, the brain, in two minutes, the sperm meets the egg. Those neurons are starting to take in. You actually also come in with information. You come in with a, a roadmap from your ancestors telling you how to handle stress, right? And in utero, you're being primed in how to handle stress. And so what's happening is, is you're getting information that's telling you how to handle stress so that you don't have to think about it. And we live in a world where we have so much taken care of for us that we don't have to pay attention to our senses anymore. You know, when we, our ancestors had to, because we didn't have roofs over our heads or clothes on our bodies or fire or whatever. So we had to pay attention to every single nuance to know what was happening. Okay. So our body releases signals that will let our brain understand what's going on so that we can take care of the problem and get back into balance right mm -hmm. so you recognize hunger you even know what you like to eat that isn't going to give you a reaction and you choose that food now the hunger is no longer there the body's back in balance so that happens on the microscopic level it happens on the macroscopic level so one of the ways the body lets you know that you're out of balance is through emotions okay <laughs> this is huge <laughs> so so they're just they're not bad uh -huh. Emotions are bad, and like you said, if you don't allow yourself to feel something, what happens, it, it traps in that energy yes. that isn't then being expressed, mm -hmm. and the energy will then feed on itself. Now, energy, you, know, you can look at it as an esoteric way of energy, energy like when it becomes blocked, you know, in Chinese medicine, create tumors and problems and all those sort of things, or stagnation, mm -hmm. right? In, in Western medicine, we look at the stress response. So if you suppress emotions and they're not expressed and you're not brought into balance, the stress response continues to fire. That means adrenaline and cortisol are firing, inflammatory cells are firing, heart rate's going up, blood pressure's going up, digestive system's shutting down, hormones are out of whack. So you can see physiologically, if we don't deal with the stress and as it isn't managed, the stress response doesn't get put out, which means we get problems physically. Okay. And so the emotion is necessary because the emotion lets us know that we're in danger, that we need to take care of ourselves. But what happens is because we don't know how to separate the emotion from a situation, when we have an emotional response, a negative emotional response, it drops us away from our higher thinking brain that can make logical decisions mm -hmm. to our five-year-old self or whatever the memory is that we get brought to and we go into behavior mechanisms that may not work, may not be helpful, mm -hmm. and we're not able to think globally and clearly, right? So we'll go into, how do I make this pain go away? That's how we're driven. Numbing. We're driven, we're driven to feel better. It's not even numbing, it's we're just driven to feel better. Yeah. We don't like being uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. That's stillness. We want to be in stillness. We want to be in balance. We don't like the feeling. So we try to feel better. And because we haven't been programmed as children to recognize what we're feeling, to learn how to self-regulate in a way that isn't personal, right? Because what happens is you yell at a child or you say, you know, whatever, you punish them. They don't have a brain that says, oh, the behavior is bad. They go, I'm bad. Remember I said I had this programming and saying, I'm bad? Okay, I'm bad, not the behavior is bad. And so the emotion, the emotional memory is what brings us back to how, how do I deal with the past? And remember, we needed it because you need to be scared in order to like then if you hear a roar to recognize that it's a lion and run. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't recognize it, you don't do anything, you're dead. Yep. So that emotion is necessary. 
emotional memory is necessary, but it's not specific and it's not rational. And it's based on a memory of when you were five or six or 12 when you didn't have a brain. So you didn't have all the information. So what happens is when we drop into emotional stress, we drop into cognitive distortions, wow. right? Where we don't have the full picture. We go into a belief system that's based on untruths, mm -hmm. on, on a belief system that says I'm bad, or a belief system says you can never trust A, B, and C, the all or nothing statements. Mm -hmm. You're not a rational adult human being making objective decisions. Mm -hmm. which is so don't you're make any decisions in that state of mind. Never make a decision when you're emotional, even when you're really happy, because that clouds you. I mean, you've been in love. How stupid do you get when you're in love? <laughs> Very. I mean, you're happier, but you want to be in, in stillness, okay. right? You want to be in a state of equanimity where you don't care one way or another, and you're able to make a decision. And if an emotion's involved, that's impossible, okay? Emotions are letting us know we're out of balance that we're in need. So take care of the need and then look at your situation. And so if the body's in need and we're not taking care of it, it gets sick, right? So we look at the different stressors that happen in our modern day world, like we're tired, but we don't sleep. We drink caffeine. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, we need some quiet and we live in the city where there's just a lot of noise pollution. And we need green space, but we live in the city and there's no green space. You know, little things like that that we don't think is bo are bothering us, but it actually is because we haven't been around long enough to not need nature. Yeah. Okay. So there's all these different things that affect us and emotions let us know that we're off. That's all. One of the things that you said um, when you were talking to us was when you experienced that rush of uh, emotions that are, that I think the conversation was around overwhelm. This changed everything for me. And you said, just tell yourself, I got this. Mm -hmm. And that was such a, it's such a re a frame for me. It's like, okay, no matter what, because I right now, last few weeks, I've been feeling slightly overwhelmed. Yeah, we've been <laughs> so, traveling a lot. A lot. And, yeah. up, and every single day I tell myself, I got this. I got this and not doing the non-negotiable, which is the meditation and the forest bathing, which we'll talk about. That's right. And time with children, which I think my, like if everything else goes away, these are things that I want. Them That's to right. Do well. That's right. So, oh, I actually have a, a, let me see where it is. The love response book. Where did I leave it? Okay. I'm just going to um, talk about it. I have it here. It's like all underlined. I have one that I can, if you want me to bring mine? To show it to you? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, because I don't know where it is right now. <laughs> Darn it, and I was preparing this morning. I was so on time. So, so just so people can see it, and we're going to link it here in um, my in very, my very first book. There we go. I love, love, love. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the things, would you hold it up again so I will take yeah. a picture and we'll, we'll post it? Yeah. God loves social media. Perfect. I should, do, I should like, maybe we do my hair the same way that I had it before. <laughs> I love it. Wait, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's, that's just the best. Um, so one of the really interesting things, this is so important. I mean, I feel like, you know, teachers appear when we're ready. Um, I, I grew up in, during the war and Bosnian war and I really never, I, I experienced really horrific things, but I, I'm always the kind of person, okay, let's go. What can we do? It's okay. Keep going. And I feel like people think that I'm happy go lucky Poliana because I'm always smiling. But I think it's despite that, and I've always been going forward. I went back to my hometown after 20 years last summer mm -hmm. and I started having panic attacks. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't, I've never seen a therapist. I've never struggled with anxiety or depression. So I, my husband, like something is wrong with you. What is wrong? So uh, I looked into it and someone said, you know, you are having a delayed onset of PTSD. And this just blew me away because I really feel like I'm the most well-adjusted human being there is. And yeah. then I'm thinking, okay, if this has been buried, literally buried for 20 years, what else is there? Because I managed to suppress it and live a very highly functional life and happy life. You adapted, yeah. I adapted, I, but I was thinking, I, what else is my cell memory that I want to look into? So what, what, what's really interesting with the love response for me was 
wow, you can actually reverse the memory of your cells, of your body, and, and get an optimal state. I'm having goosebumps all over my yeah, me body. Me too, me too. I said, wow, I said that. <laughs> I know, because I'm, wow. So I could really reverse that trauma that I had as a child. And I think like so much is happening right now with my dad passing. He lived in a concentration camp. Mm. And his story is like all of this I have taken on and never talked about. Yeah. Well, I am going through your book with like <laughs> with so <such> deep <laughs> because it's really healing. But would you tell us basically for our audience the the premise of the law of response and what can they do if they're experiencing the you know just sense of worthlessness or really feel, yeah. really feeling good in their bodies and their minds? Yeah, it's a really, really. I mean, I love this story and and um and you know it's just full of so much you know, so much information and love and, and healing. It's just, it's just beautiful. And so when I came up with this concept, um, I was actually having my own anxiety, I mean, panic attacks out of nowhere. I think I told you that story with working and having panic attacks and, um, and also my niece had been born and I had this, incre that incredible experience holding, you know, I helped her help in the delivery and I was holding this newborn. And just in that moment, of holding her like all my problems disappeared and I thought I got this <laughs> in that moment and I said wow you know that's the feeling I have within me that stillness feeling that I have when I meditate and was able to research the research to discover that the state of pure love is actually simulates the state of meditation or the relaxation response they're very similar physiologically mm -hmm. and so I thought to myself oh okay so let me see how I can you know how do I work with this and bring this into into my work and um, and what more does this have to do right if there's this if I think I'm bad and I'm you know this successful you know relatively attractive person right what does everybody else think? And so that to me was, was sort of an indication of like, this is a human issue. This is an existential issue. This isn't just me. You know, people say, oh, I love myself. Do you? Do you? Because if you did, you wouldn't be drinking so much alcohol. You would exercise more, right? You would blah, 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 blah. Like we would treasure ourselves. We would treasure. Right. I love this. I have a very dear friend. We've, you know, rather than saying it like, well, we say, I love you sometimes, but we say, I treasure you. Like who says that? Right. To try to really treasure something. Right. And I thought, I don't think we really treasure ourselves because if we did, we would not have war. Right. Because if I feel treasured, then I don't have a problem with you. Yeah. Because what I get upset with you about is because you don't treasure me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was sort of like this build up to that, you know, what these, these wisdom teachers have said for thousands of years that love heals, like, they're onto something. And indeed, if you really look at sort of our ability to survive as a species, stress is definitely necessary. But so is love. Because without love, we wouldn't actually bond and stay together and we wouldn't be able to actually raise young. Yes. Okay, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be stupid enough to stay with, with people right? <laughs> but we wouldn't also worry about others being okay and, and staying together as a social structure. So, you know, I broke it down to um, social, social love, self-love, and spiritual love, which is our, our social connections, our ability to love ourselves, and our ability to connect to something much larger than ourselves, whether it's spiritual or nature or purpose, that allows our species to truly survive and, 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 and for us to succeed and be well and do well. So that was sort of like how that came together. And when I was started working with people with this, I found that what was inhibiting them from going further, and they, some of them had 20 years of therapy, mm -hmm. right? And they were still talking about the same story. And, and which most people do because talk therapy can only get you so far. Well, I love it, don't get me wrong, it's necessary, but it can only get you so far because the body's holding on to stuff. It's holding on to stuff that if you don't actually go into it, which you can do through that short meditative state, mm -hmm. and reprogram the experience of the younger you, because the older you is fine, because your higher brain's fine, but the younger you isn't in the higher brain. Remember, the higher brain wasn't there yet. 
Yeah. Yeah. The younger you was being held in the cells of your body. Right. And so when we actually allow those memories to come up and then create a healing experience around it, so it doesn't negate that that experience happened, it changes the way you view yourself within the context of the situation. So this is huge. So if you, it, uh, because I've been resisting accepting the fact that that happened to me. Because uh, it's so foreign, right? I'm like, I had at least such a wonderful life and that's misery. So if anyone is experiencing something, allow it to come up right. in a safe well, space. And like, do it in a way where you feel safe enough to do so, right? So if you don't have, you know, that's where practitioners are, net, are important often to help guide you and help you feel safe enough. And, and that's what the love response is. It's creating a cushion, yeah. right? So I might not take somebody into something super deep right away. We create a cushion first, mm -hmm. right? The cushion of self-love, social love, and spiritual love. So that you then, when you have this love and you have this great life with so much love and so many treasures in your life, that now, which you might, you didn't have 10, maybe 15 years ago, you have the capacity to let it up. Yes. Because it's deep trauma. Because now I can, I can let it up and not go into fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is if you can't remove yourself from the emotion, you fall into it and get right back into the drama mm -hmm. and you're right back into that. It happens happening to me again, as opposed to being able to step back and observe it. Right. Which is when I take people through those meditations, it's about being able to have love in your midst, mm -hmm. being able to see what happens and heal that child, heal that situation. So that child isn't, I'm bad. I'm okay. Like that happened. It was horrible. I'm going to let go of that memory and let me move into my true memory, my true life of how I see myself. Right. Okay. So, so this, a lot of this stuff is unconscious and hidden and, and many people just repress it because it's not conducive to survival. Well, if you, if you lived in the trauma constantly, you wouldn't have been able to succeed. Yeah. So there's something valuable about that, right? We, our brain like we'll lock stuff down mm -hmm. so that we can survive. Mm -hmm. It's what we would call it, you know, it's coping. Yes. It might be maladaptive coping, but it's still coping nonetheless. And that's gotten us this far. So you're, you're not going to let go of some of those skills that have gotten you here. We just want to create balance around them. Right. No, I, that, that was it, everything you're saying is literally, I am, I am just, I am going to be marketing this fun. <laughs> <laughs> so much because I really think that in the people that I talk to, my friends, my family, I see this happen so often and it's so personal to me right now. It's like mm -hmm. I'm evangelizing this topic because I think we don't talk about it enough. You know, mm -hmm. I'm in the entrepreneurship world and we talk about making money and being successful. And it's really lovely. I love that conversation. Right. Too. We love that. Almost. But I'm noticing that we're not addressing this because it seems so woo-woo, right? For, for, for so technical. Um, right, and they don't know the practicality of that, right? So, and this idea of like, well, what is driving you to be an entrepreneur, right? So what people don't realize is that there's a, a reason behind everything. There's a drive. Like, I want to make money. Well, why do I want to make money? Because money is going to bring me what? Security, happiness, well, that's really what you're looking for. So why don't you think you have security? Why don't think you have happiness? Mm -hmm. And so then people have said, well, if I deal with that, then I won't have this drive that I have. Oh, you'll still have the drive, but you won't have the imbalance that's leading to the drive. That's huge. So give yourself yeah. the emotion that you're seeking first. So it will be balanced. And then you're still going to go, but it's going to be with balance. And you're not going to deny yourself sleep. You're not going to deny yourself time off because that's what entrepreneurs do. They don't know when to stop. Yeah. They don't yeah. know when to stop. They're working 24 seven. And then like the next thing they know, like, okay, most entrepreneurs are young. So you don't feel anything, but wait till you're 40, 50 years old when the body's going, oh, I don't know. I don't think I can do this anymore. I don't, I don't like and people, it. And people say, well, I'll have billions by then. So I don't have to work. Right. It's like, well, why do you want to wait till you're making billions and you're 50 to be happy and healthy? Okay. You can have it all. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, when you said that to us, I went into my room and I wrote down what yeah. is the feeling that I'm wanting. This is full transparency. I can't believe yeah. I'm saying this so live that uh, so many people will hear, but it was, I don't matter. 
And it was just like, wow. So, you know, it was a middle child. And then, you know, here I am thinking we're during the war. The whole world is turning a blind eye. Like, I don't matter. No one cares. No one cares. I don't. And it was like, so needing to accomplish so much, like, I matter, darn it. I matter. But I, I have the same issue, right? We, it's like, if, if you think about it, like you have it. So does everybody else. Yeah. Again, that's why we have wars and, and fights because people feel like they don't matter. Mm -hmm. Why do couples argue? Because they feel they don't matter. <laughs> they feel that that person isn't making us feel special. We all want to feel special. Yes. You know, one of the hardest things I think for people with the studies with social media, right, is to see all these people, you know, everybody posts like happy stuff. And then people are sitting in their house is going, well, my life isn't that happy. Right. I don't matter as much. I don't have as many friends. I don't have as many likes, you know? And so it's being transposed into that with this idea of I don't matter, right? I don't matter enough. enough. So then, so then what I've looked into again with my own stuff, as I worked through this through the years was, okay, well, I do matter. You know, my family loves me, blah, blah, blah. But, mm -hmm. right. There's the yeah, but. Mm -hmm. it never ends never ever you have never all these enough. people and all these things that are proving to you that you matter but yet that belief system that i don't matter is still yet there it's never enough it's an empty bucket an empty well so unless you take care of it it continues you and literally can drive people into their deaths I'm working on it. You know I am. I, I like, know you are. <laughs> I, have, I have decided to have a Tuesdays are my healing days. Great. So I, have, I now I have a, a working with a, with a wonderful healer. I think that you may know. I um, know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I recommended you go to her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, uh, and acupuncturist. And it's really taking the day. It's like, sounds so silly, but I feel like if I don't make the time for this, intentionally it's not going to it's not going not to gonna happen no. so uh dr eva we're already at the mark where normally i'm like i am just i have a few more questions <laughs> there's so much to talk about oh, no. <laughs> i just have a few a few more questions uh so ever since i've met you i've uh, been forest baiting hmm. and i think i've been tagging you in my walks because it's just it's so spiritual i work out a lot so for me it's like I have to go on the weight and do cardio and, mm -hmm. and it was very difficult to say no today i'm just walking around the lake yeah yeah and so tell us why forest bathing is so important especially for entrepreneurs oh so many so many reasons um so it was starting in japan called shinrin yoku uh shinrin yoku which is translates to forest bathing and literally you're bathing your senses in the experience of walking through a forest Okay. And so what's happening there? You're not going with an aim. So an entrepreneur always has a goal, right? I'm going to go from point A to point B to point C. I'm going to, my three-year plan, my five-year plan, I'm going to make billions of dollars. Go, go, go. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, I'm not so different than that. I'm very goal-oriented. The problem is, is when you're so focused on the goal, you've missed everything along the way, right? And so there's, you know, this is a big wave around mindfulness right now of being non-judgmentally aware and being in the present moment without your thoughts going other way, without having a goal. And that's what forest bathing is, is using all your senses, what I feel, what I see, what I smell, what I taste, just engaging and bathing your senses in the experience of walking aimlessly in nature. Without a goal, you're not going to, you know, have to get there at a certain time. It's just, so what's happening is, is you're getting the benefits of meditation which is the mindfulness piece of turning off that constant babble. You get the benefits of being in this beautiful essence of nature which actually creates that spiritual love experience, creates dopamine, oxytocin, morphine-like substances. It's literally, it's like putting a drop of morphine in your brain of, of this experience. And then you actually get all the benefits of nature with to have unseen elements that are you know, getting through your nasal passages and, and your breathing that are actually creating a health through you. So improving your immune system, reducing stress levels. And like, you know, 20 minutes is all you need and you're a brand new person. Wow, that's, it's been a sacred practice of mine. We're going to, so I invite everyone to 
really take us up on this and then tag Dr. Eva somehow when, when doing for us. Baby. Yeah, let us know how it works for you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what would you like your legacy to be, Dr. Eva? Gosh, you know, that's a, it's a really good question because it's something that I have, I have actually been thinking about legacy lately. You know, I think you turn 50 and you start thinking about legacy. I will be 52 this year, but, um, you know, what, what is my work? Um, what do I, where do I want the work and my teachings to go? I think what I'd love to see is people starting to be more conscious of the words that they're using, their actions, and I would love to be that sort of a person who creates a wave of change, mm -hmm. right? The wave of change of the choice to be present, the choice to be loving, the choice to be kind and grateful, but yet also be pragmatic and realistic and get stuff done, right? This isn't like woo woo. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm going to be practical. I'm going to have a great life. I'm going to be successful and I'm going to be conscious. So I would love that, that legacy to be in the teachings of how to be a conscious, happy person in this earth to enable this earth to still be here, yeah. right? Because at this rate, who knows? <laughs> That's yeah. beautiful. I think you're already doing that. I mean, left and right, the, the, I'm, I really mean this when I say it. I would not be having this conversation if you didn't make such an impact on me. And I think that I, with my children, the way I am, I've already made significant changes because of you and Michael, Michael Gallup. Yes. That have already really transformed my life. And I think that that is one by one, right? It's the, the cascade. Yeah. I'm happy enough that I have an audience of, I call them light workers. Yeah. Who are listening and are willing to take, uh, take, take that, uh, take that, take that on so well, that, well, that's my goal now my goal is to work with people like yourself uh, people in leadership positions that have the ability to influence many yeah. right so when i started i worked with every you know a lot of, of people you know the masses if you will and as i've gotten to this place of legacy right my goal is like i need to work with the influencers yes because the influencers will influence everybody else <laughs> i can't influence everybody but I can influence the influencers who influence everybody else. It's like, are you going to be a, a pebble in the water, which creates a ripple effect? Or are you going to be a boulder? Mm. And I said, I want to work with the boulders <laughs> because the boulders are going to get the pebbles and so on and so on and so forth. And so that's sort of where I am now is how do I influence the people who influence? You know, I might not have like a thousand, you know, 10,000, 100,000 followers, but I can influence the person who's got 100,000 followers. Yes, we're going to be working <laughs> on that because we want everyone here to come and follow you right, right away. And I think that you did that in our room with, with Rob yeah. that night. I mean, we were all just, I mean, you came up so much in that, in that weekend. Oh. Uh, you really made, made such, such an impact. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the, more of the work you do really quickly because I want to respect your time and wrap this up. I, I feel like I could talk to you forever. I know um, we could. I know. Best book. And these are just very quickly right off the top of your mind. Best book. Well, the book that I always go back to and always read is The Alchemist. The Alchemist. I love that one. Yeah, I love that uh, book. I'll finish the sentence. Life is. Magical. <laughs> My current struggle is. Well, my current struggle is um, stepping out of my introverted ways and putting myself more out in the world. <laughs> and you're doing this so beautifully. <laughs> having faith means? Uh, having faith means trusting in the unknown and knowing that it's all for the best. Mm. Um, uh, best advice I was ever given? That's an easy one. I was talking to a spiritual um, guide once, like I was 20, 25, I think. And she said to me, you think you want what everybody else wants, right? The money, kids, whatever. She goes, but that's a Hayoka, which is the Native American, Native American term for clown. The, like the clown that tries to distract you. Mm -hmm. And she said, mind you, this is 
27 years ago that I got this information. It's still with me. And she said, um, she said, it's just a Hayoka, just a clown trying to distract you from your path. And she said, follow your mission, follow your passion. The rest will be gifted and given. Oh, wow. That's really good. <laughs> right? I think we could all take that off. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just telling you, it's the best advice I've ever gotten. It was, I'm sure she doesn't even remember she said it. You know, <laughs> it probably was it was it was uh, uh, downloaded. Yeah, it was a download. I love that, yeah. Doctor Eva. You are amazing. You speak. At, uh, I want to tell our audience that what it is that you do day to day and month to month. You speak to companies. Um, they come to you've been on uh, some of the biggest. At TV shows, CBS, <laughs> show, which is really, uh, really wonderful. You work with people one on one, yeah. and you have published so many of the of the books. We're going to for everyone else. Please stay tuned. We're going to do a giveaway. So after this conversation, listen to the instructions uh, about about that. But tell us where to find you if you want to work with you one on one. If you would like to have you come and speak in our companies, yeah. where can we find you and, and anything else you would like to ask? Well, you certainly find me on social media sites, of course. So okay. you know, Facebook, yeah, LinkedIn, yeah. Instagram. Um, you can go to my website, uh, drselhub.com. That's the drselhub.com. And you can fill out the contact form and it'll come right to me. And you can request whatever you want to request, whether it's working with me individually or to request uh, a, a keynote or a lecture or a workshop. I just had um, somebody call me to do um, a three-hour workshop. Uh, with their company, with their group. So it can be three hours, it could be two days, it could be one hour. Um, and then uh, what I also do is work with companies to do, uh, whether I'm consulting on wellness programs or just working with uh, the executives. And I do resiliency coaching with the, the exec executives. Wow, that's, that's wow. huge. That's really fun. Uh, um, uh, so Everyone, you, you could hear the enthusiasm and the love that I have for this woman. I cannot thank you enough for your time, you. for your work, because I really, truly think that it's life-changing. For me, at least. Okay. Well, I have to say, like I said, for, like I said, my legacy is to work with people like yourself and to know that you're now influencing others with what you've learned. I really, see, I really feel accomplished now. Oh, <laughs> good. Like, yes, this is what I aim to do and it's happening. Great. So, you know, I always tell people, I just want to show up and do what I love, right? Okay. Don't want to worry about the, like the, the logistics of stuff. I just want to be able to show up. That and, makes sense. Um, yeah. I just want to show up and do what I love and do this work because it's, as you can see, I'm quite passionate about it. And I love seeing people blossom. That to me is the most exciting thing in the world. Well, so especially uh, people who think they've like done it all yeah. and then you see them even like blossom even more. It's just, yeah. I, That's I, what I'm I mean, you've opened up a whole new different reality. And That's I, right. So it's much. boundless, boundless. Yeah. Yes. I really cannot thank you enough. So much love for you. Uh, and, and I have no words except thank you, thank you. I love you so much, so oh, much. Thank you all. <laughs> Bye, Dr. Eva. Thank you. Bye.